the Sampung department store collapse. In complete dark, confined by a pile of concrete, lies Park Soon Hyung, a saleswoman at the children's wear shop at the Sampung department store in Seoul. She was overwhelmed with the feeling of luck to be alive, but was confused with the situation she found herself in at the time. The last thing she remembered was that she returned from her lunch break before the ceiling and the floor beneath her collapsed. There was a mention about the problems on the fifth floor, she thought. Apart from some rumors, neither she or any other employees in the store knew that the catastrophe was imminent. The building was on the verge of collapse for some time. What more, it was built to cave in. Welcome to Dark History. If you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing and like this video. Like a house of cards. It was a busy day at the Sampung store that June 29, 1995. Like every other day, people were swarming to the store buying groceries, clothes, furniture, toys for their kids, pottery, and other houseware. It was not unusual for one of the most popular department stores in Seoul to be overcrowded. On average, it had a daily inflow of cash up to a half a million dollars. When the disaster struck the building at 5.52 p.m., hundreds of customers were inside. Just a moment before the entire building collapsed, they heard a powerful cracking sound followed by an alarm. Many of them never reached the safety stairs when the building caved in like a house of cards. The noise that everyone inside the store witnessed came from the fifth floor, the top of the building. The sound source was the rooftop slab that was buckling under the weight of the air conditioning system. Minutes before it collapsed, it was interspersed with cracks up to four inches in width. The first such cracks appeared in April that same year and have been only deteriorating since. There was no doubt that the air conditioning system caused the damages. Two years earlier, a 45-ton system was dragged across the south wing's roof because the neighbors from nearby buildings complained about the noise it made. The traction caused the concrete slab to weaken, after which the first fissures appeared. The vibrations of the air conditioning system made it worse each day. On June 29, 1995, the slab was in irreparable condition. What more, it was on the verge of collapsing. Around noon, the first loud noise coming from the top of the south wing occurred. It hardly distracted the customers who complained only about the unpleasant vibrations they felt. Little did they know that the vibration caused the rooftop slab to crack and produce a loud noise. The structural engineers were called to the site to inspect the severity of the situation. Their conclusion was grim. The slab was definitely going to collapse and it would cause the lower slabs to sag as well. The air conditioning system was immediately switched off to prevent vibrations and further cracking of the slab. An emergency board meeting was called to discuss the situation. The board concluded that the building was unsafe and that everyone inside should evacuate. Everyone present realized the seriousness of the situation except for the chairman of the Sampoon Group, Mr. Lee Jun. Lee was furious with his advisors proposing such a stupid thing that would only cause him to lose revenues. Such things you don't do in business. The meeting ended and the store continued to work in the usual fashion. At 5 p.m., the fifth floor started to sink, but there was still no evacuation. The only thing store workers did was cut off the top floor access. 52 minutes later, the slab gave in and the air conditioning system fell through. What followed was the collapse of the entire south wing of the building. The central part was first to go down. The corners and side walls simply fell on top of it. Everything lasted for not more than 10 seconds. The structure crumbled as if it was destroyed in a controlled explosion. Only the southernmost facade remained in place, holding the name and the sign of the Sampoon brand under the pile of concrete. For several moments, there was nothing but silence. Shocked bystanders simply couldn't believe what they have just witnessed. The silence was broken by the sounds of sirens and shouts of people who rushed to look for survivors. The ambulance and rescue teams arrived at the scene in just a few minutes. Immediately beginning the rescue operation, it was anything but an effortless task. The site was covered with a pile of concrete that had to be removed to reach the survivors. Using heavy machinery to remove the debris, rescue teams concentrated their effort on the basement and the sides of the building. 
The situation gave little chance that victims underneath the pile in the middle of the site were lucky enough to survive. During the first two days, the death toll was much higher than the number of rescued. The operation was becoming more and more dangerous as time passed. The concrete was sinking and the danger of fire and toxic fumes was increasing. On July 1st, the mayor called off the operation as the site was declared too dangerous for rescuers. If it weren't for the protests of furious citizens, relatives of those trapped in ruins, the number of rescued would have indeed been much smaller. This way, the rescue teams continued to search for survivors. They broke through the concrete and steel using heavy equipment, looking for any signs of life. The noise of excavators, workers shouting, and helicopters flying over the site was broken every now and then with minutes of silence as rescuers were trying to locate the calls for help. In agony, people trapped below debris were screaming for help, pounded the pipes, anything they could do to attract the attention of the rescuers. It was a true miracle how some of the poor men and women survived being trapped for a few weeks that the rescue operation lasted. It was sort of luck that rain fell, as many used the rainwater to quench the thirst and stay alive. It was a sheer will to live that kept them alive while waiting for rescuers to find them. The last survivor to be rescued from the ruins of the Sampung department store was Park Soong Hyun, 16 days after the collapse built to collapse. After the rescue operation finished, a question arose. How on earth the entire wing of the building collapsed? Naturally, the prime suspects were the North Koreans, who posed a massive threat to the security of South Korea for half a century. The second guess was a gas leak which caused buildings to collapse in the recent past. The thorough research concluded the collapse was caused by the breakdown of the fifth floor ceiling under the weight of the air conditioning system. The real question was how come the rooftop slab failed to withstand the system's weight, no matter how heavy it was? The answer was quite simple. The Sampung department store's design and structure were so weak that one might think it was built to collapse. The building was not supposed to be a department store when the construction started in 1987. The original plan was for the Wusung Construction Company to build a four-story residential building on the site. When the foundations were already built, the investor, the Sam Poon Group, namely its owner Lee Jun, altered the purpose of the building. Instead of a residential building, he decided to build a department store. Not a big issue, right? The problem was that the department store called for a considerable alteration of the initial design. Since the zoning regulations didn't allow a building fully built as a department store, Jun added another floor for a skating rink. The later, third plan replaced the skating rink with restaurants. The alteration of initial plans was made simply for financial reasons. The department store was bringing more money than a residential building. Engineers of the Wusung Construction Company strongly objected to new altered plans and even left the project after June insisted on implementing them. But what was the problem with the new plans? First, the Sampung department store was a flat slab structure meaning that slabs as structural elements of the building had no steel framework and were not supported by crossbeams. Instead, slabs were entirely supported by horizontal concrete columns. Such structures were less expensive, but needed to have a perfect design, primarily regarding the layout of the supporting columns. Once the Wusung Group left the site, the construction work was taken over by the Sampoon Group's construction division. Under the direct control of Lee Jun, Architects and construction engineers were instructed to speed up the works and cut the expenses as much as possible. It was precisely what they did. The research showed that lower quality concrete was used to construct slabs and columns. Besides, many columns were up to 11 inches thinner than planned, many of them with only eight reinforcing rods instead of 16. A larger span between supporting columns was made to get more space for the shops thus reducing the load capacity of the entire construction. The conversion from a residential building to a department store aggravated the already poorly made structure. Korean construction standards implied that department stores had elevators. Installing ones in the Sampung department store meant punching holes in slabs and omitting support columns to make space for the elevator shafts. Also, to meet the fire regulations required in a department store, many supporting columns suffered changes that reduced their strength. However, the crucial problem for the building's stability was the addition of the fifth floor. 
June planned to make the fifth floor a gallery of restaurants. Since Korean restaurant customers were sitting on the floor, an underheating system had to be installed, increasing the overall weight of the floor slab. With heavy restaurant equipment, the weight of the fifth floor overburdened the weak structure of the bottom four floors. On top of everything, the top floor was utterly incompatible with the lower floors. Support columns on the fifth floor were not positioned in line with the columns below. Therefore, the weight of the rooftop was transferred to the concrete slab instead of on supporting columns. It was a fact of less importance if it wasn't for a heavy air conditioning system installed on the rooftop. Typically, such systems were installed on the ground, but the Sampung engineers moved it to the rooftop, fearing that the neighbors might complain because of the noise it makes. Such a move implied the recalculations of the rooftop's loading capacity and the installment of new additional columns, something that Sampung constructors never did. Later calculations showed that the roof slab's loading capacity was four times smaller than needed. When, in 1993, the relocation of the system caused the roof slab to crack, the final stage of the absolute negligence in constructing and maintaining the building was set. Aftermath the consequences of the poor construction caused by the desire for financial gain were catastrophic. The final death toll was 502 people, with another 937 injured, making the Sampung department store collapse the worst peacetime disaster in the history of South Korea. The report made by Professor Lan Chung blamed the catastrophe on human ignorance, negligence, and greed. The first to be accused was none other than the head of the Sampung group, Lee Jun. Not only that, June illegally altered the building's design and changed its purpose, but he intentionally neglected all the signs that the building's structure was insecure. On the day of the catastrophe, he refused to evacuate the building, even though he made sure to leave the building before it collapsed. On trial, Lee Jun expressed regret for the loss of lives, but also for the substantial financial damage to his company. He was eventually found guilty of criminal negligence and sentenced to 10 and a half years in prison. He left the prison after seven and a half years served, only to die several months later. Lee's son and the CEO of the department store, Lee Han Sang, was sentenced to seven years of prison. Several local officials and store executives were also convicted for bribery and negligence of the supervision of the construction and refusal to act on the indication of structural problems. Not even the fact that everyone involved was sent to trial and sentenced nor the collapse of the Sampung group and the Lee family whose entire wealth was offered to settle the compensation for the families of victims was not enough to ease the public outrage after the tragedy. The entire society, enthralled by the country's economic boom, overlooked the corruption and greed of the big companies that grew to the level where human lives became irrelevant to financial gains. Thank you for watching our video. If you like it, please remember to hit the like button. If you want to see more of us, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. See you next time. Stay safe.